Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Arizona. My name is Yvonne Montoya. Um, we are here today to speak with you about Dance in the Desert. Uh, but before I get started, I'm going to ask the panelists, my colegas, to please introduce themselves. So I'll hand this over to Aaron. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Erin Donahue, and I was one of the funders. Um, and um, that, yeah, that was my role in Dance in the Desert. Um, I work here at Arizona State University, um, and uh, we're really excited to be here with you this morning. Buenos dias. My name is Gabriela Munoz. I work at the Arizona Commission on the Arts as the Artist Programs Manager, and I was also a funder of the program. Good morning, my name is Ruby Morales, and I was a participant um, during the program. I am from here, Arizona. I'm a dancer, choreographer, and I currently work for a nonprofit, and I teach second, third, and fourth graders. I'm Yvonne Montoya. I live in Tucson, Arizona. I'm the founding director of Southwest Dance Theater. I'm also a choreographer, um, and I was the organizer and visionary behind Dance in the Desert. Good morning, everyone. My name is Reina Montoya. We are not related. <laughs> um, I was born in Tijuana, Mexico, but I grew up in Mesa, Arizona, which is about 20, 15 minutes away from here. And I was a participant in Dance in the Desert. I am also a choreographer, a dancer, and an arts maker. And I am the founder and executive director of Aliento. Hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Adriana Harris, nacida en Agua Prieta, Sonora, México, y residente de Douglas, Arizona, que es frontera. Um, mi papel en este programa fue participante y soy directora de danza, coreógrafa y performer. Her name is Adriana Harris. She was born in Agua Prieta, Mexico. She's a resident at Douglas, which is a border, a border city. She's a performer, a dancer, director, a choreographer, and, a part and, she, and her role within Dance in the Desert was a participant. And she's also a performer. So before we get started, I'm going to give a brief overview about what Dance in the Desert was um, and try to capture everything um, in a snapshot. It happened um, April 26th through the 28th here in the Phoenix area. It was a gathering of Latinx dance makers. We had 14 uh, dancers and choreographers from mostly from Arizona, but also from other parts of the nation come together, as well as eight um, scholars, arts administrators, um, and funders, Latinx scholars, arts administrators, and funders. We had three um, communities from Arizona represented, the Phoenix metro area, which is a large metropolitan area, Tucson, I was representing Tucson, which is a small mid-sized city, uh, it's a mid-sized city, and you all will be there uh, at the end of this weekend, enjoying um, the desert there and uh, Douglas Agua Prieta, which is a rural border community about four hours southeast of here. So we had those three communities in Arizona represented. We also had um, some members from the national community. So Adriana Gallego from NALAC, she's the chief operating officer, uh, came, attended, and moderated our community share out. We had Alejandra Duque Cifuentes, who is a interim co-executive director of Dance NYC. And we also had members of the Decolonial Epistemologies Lab come, so Fabiola Toralba from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Mireya Guerra, who is a researcher, um, she does research in dance, that's, uh, she's in Burlington, Vermont, and um, Fabian Barba from Quito, Ecuador, also Skyped in to the majority of, uh, of Dance in the Desert. I'm also one of the original members of the Decolonial Epistemologies Lab. Um, so it was centered and focused on dance makers from Arizona, but also with connections to national communities. Um, Dance in the Desert was an inaugural program. It was a pilot. Uh, we began with a master class, um, some choreography, so the dancers got to move and create together. Um, we also had a choreography workshop where local dancers, Arizona-based dancers, showed work in progress, and they were able to get feedback from a a, a group of peers, of Latinx peers who understood the aesthetics that which they're working in. Um, I'm often pushing my um, 
my own personal practice towards decolonial methodologies. And so to have a panel, um, a group of colegas who um, understand the direction in which I'm going was really important. Uh, we had some closed door dancer meetings where we just got together and talked and talked about our assets and our strengths and also some of the challenges we faced and looked at commonalities across stories and differences because we were all different. We all came from different backgrounds, different immigration statuses, different generation statuses, different countries. Um, and to look at what are some of the similarities, what are some of the differences. We had closed door meetings with our arts administrators, funders, and scholars to talk about some of the ways in which they can help us move Latinx art forward, both in Arizona, in the Southwest, and nationally. Uh, we conducted some research, so we uh, did two focus groups. Uh, they were about an hour and a half long. They had six people each. These were conducted by my colega Mireya Guerra. And we're using that data. We're still in the process of transcribing them. And that will eventually be used to hopefully create uh, a larger national survey that can be done um, for Latinx dancers across the states. And this is modeled after a survey of dance makers that was done um, in Ecuador uh, a few years back. Uh, we're still collecting, we're going to need to collect more samples to develop that tool, but that's, that's the goal with that. We had a community share out where um, we had uh, arts administrators from Scottsdale Center from the Arts, uh, Del Webb Arts Center, Mesa Arts Center. We had some of the local school districts come and have a dialogue with us about how they can best support um, emerging Latinx choreographers and dancers in their community. And then we, we ended with the pachanga, so all of the participants' families got to come. Um, we danced. There was food. There was food at all the events. We had happy hours. We had food, and um, our fam a lot of us traveled with our families, and our families and kids and everybody got to come out and celebrate with us. So that is kind of like the overview. In terms of who was there, we had high school students, we had high school seniors. Um, so the age range was from about 16, 17 to about 45. In terms of experience level, um, again, from high school seniors to dance professionals, we had some of the uh, Latinx uh, dance professors from ASU. Again, Adriana Gallego, Alejandra Duquisi Fuentes, their um, arts administrators at the executive level. Um, we also had you know, interns that are working with arts organizations and so on and so forth. So we were very um, robust and different in, in that regard. Uh, the project came together with um, funding by uh, Arizona Arts Commission and the AZ Art Worker Program, which Gabriela will talk to you about and how they are supporting um, Arizona artists. Uh, we had funding from Liz Lerman LLC, which Aaron also wears a hat and works for. Um, ASU is specifically the Projecting All Voices Initiative, which is um, a program of uh, Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. I know it is Haida, but I tried to get the acronym right for you. Uh, and um, ASU Gamage. Uh, I was a fellow there last year, and so they supported uh, this project through that and through some funding through the Dean's Creativity Council. We also, Safo Stance Theater, um, my organization contributed as well. We had funding from the Western States Arts Federation with monies that came from the NEA. We also had community partnerships. We performed at Grant Street Studios and also at Phoenix um, Hostel and Cultural Center. Um, that's where we had our pachanga. So, um, yeah, that was, that's, is, is, am I missing? anything? Is there anything I'm forgetting? Oh, there's one thing I do want to mention. In order to eliminate the financial barriers, um, barriers to travel that we often see in rural Arizona and even in mid-sized cities like Tucson, um, the entire thing was paid for, it was free, um, and travel was covered for those that came from out of the city. So, um, yeah, that's another thing I wanted to share. So, in the spirit of um, co-facilitation, because Dance in the Desert was really an uh, a learning experience, a peer-to-peer -peer learning experience where we came together and we talked as colleagues and we learned from each other. So in that spirit, rather than having a panelist ask questions, we are all, all of us up here are going to co-moderate and co-facilitate the panel. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Bibi, um, who has our first question. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I have a question. What was the inspiration for Dance in the Desert? Muchas gracias, Bibi. Um, the inspiration for Dance in the Desert 
came after I did a fellowship with the National Dance Organization and I was asked to be paired with a Latina um, because I don't have any mentors. I know of an elder in my community in Tucson, Eva Tesler, who has worked and has a really big, robust body of work and is a member of the Latina Dance Theater Project and we have a relationship. Um, but I didn't know of any other elders and I wanted to be connected with someone nationally. And they couldn't find anyone for me because this, they only knew one or two um, Latina dance makers of an, an older generation. And I was uh, I thought to myself, that can't be right. There has to be more of us out there. Um, I know that there are. I think that we're just really disconnected. There's no community. Um, and then as a part of my mentorship, I was mentored by Rosie Simas, who's an indigenous choreographer who's amazing. I had a wonderful experience um, getting to know her and learning from her. But she took me to the um, indigenous choreographers, contemporary choreographers gathering at UC Riverside. And it was amazing to see all these internationally coming together of indigenous choreographers to share work, to talk about scholarship, um, there were dance workshops, so on and so forth, and I thought to myself, why isn't there anything like this for the Latinx community, or even for the dance community in the Southwest? Um, we have our very own unique um, borderlands aesthetics here, um, the history is unique here to the space, and, and there, there isn't anything. So I wanted to bring together, just so we can get to know each other, um, a group of Latinx dance makers. And, and another example is I'm the only that I know of, it could have changed because I'm not working in Tucson a whole lot now, I'm doing a lot of work up here. But at that time, I was the only Latina Chicana choreographer working in contemporary movements in Tucson. Uh, and I didn't have a community of practitioners to, to work with, to share with. And I knew of people that were doing work up in Phoenix. I knew of Liliana Gomez, but, and I knew of Angie, um, Angelina Ramirez, who's a flamenca. But I didn't have a really strong relationship with them. And I thought, they're only two hours away, which in the Southwest isn't very far, right? Far for us is about a six-hour drive, so they're relatively geographically close, although we're still very isolated. So I said, you know, I need to invest in a relationship with them and reach out. And then, I, unbeknownst to me, two hours southeast from where I live, there's a very robust contemporary dance community in Douglas Agua Prieta. And so I said, why don't we start by connecting these communities and building these relationships so that we know that we're not alone um, and let's start there. So that was a desire for, for kinship, friendship, um, collaboration, and also peers to help me further my work was really the inspiration for this. And also the search for our mentors, for our elders, and also again, and our peers. So that was the inspiration behind Dance in the Desert. And I, I did shop this idea around for about two years before um, before ACA bit so thank you so much for that yeah who's next so this question is for Gabriela and Aaron so I know that you were really essential and part of making dancing the desert happen so can you tell us a little bit more about how does dancing the desert really use um, this horizontal leadership and how does it really work? Because I think sometimes we use these like words in the vacuum, but it's like horizontal leadership. Can you define it? Can you tell me how it looks in practice? Yeah. Any okay. spaces? <laughs> <laughs> so I run an initiative at the Arizona Commission on the Arts called AZ Art Worker. It is generously funded by the Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation. And we are in our fourth year. Um, we're very fortunate. So the program is really meant to be a peer-to-peer -peer learning, professional development, um, training for artists, and it takes it takes many shapes depending on what is needed. In the we work in four communities: we work in Phoenix, we work in Tucson, which is a mid-sized community, we work in Douglas, Arizona, which is a, a border rural community, and then we also do some work. Um, in cells, which is in Tahana Atam Nation. And from the very beginning, the program was set up to serve community and to be responsive to every community's need, which means that the programming is all different um, because the programming is meant to be peer-to-peer -peer so that if we invite an artist, there is shared learning that happens. Um, rather than um, an outside artist parachuting in and sort of teaching community members and artists in that community how to be 
um, how to be an artist. They often already are doing lots of great work. We also thought that then the structure of the funding should also be peer-to-peer -peer so that it's, it's as horizontal as possible in nature, acknowledging the fact that if you are a funder, as is my, my fortune to be, there is always a, a predetermined um, asymmetrical uh, power relationship. Because if it was truly horizontal, then Yvonne wouldn't have to send me an email and schedule a lunch and then for us to talk, right? Then we would simply speak to each other. Um, but so the program is really, um, we, we work really, really hard to try and adhere to as horizontal a structure um, between the, the artists that we're working with in community as possible. Um, so really I think my goal is to act as a gopher and as an arts administrator that works for whatever artists or organization it is that we're working with. And we struggle really hard to find partnerships that align in terms of the mission and the vision of what it is that we're trying to do and how it is that we're trying to engage and serve um, communities. So we actually um, talked to Erin um, because of a lot of her practices um, and her work sort of aligned and I'll let her talk about her experience with that. Thank you. Um, I just have to say too, working with Gabriella and Yvonne is like the most joyful and collaborative experience I've ever had. Um, I've worked with a lot of artists in a lot of different places and these two women are, am I allowed to swear? They're the most badass people. <laughs> like they're just the best. Um, and c realizing their vision, um, I think, much like Gabriella said, um, when I have my arts administrator hat on, um, the best thing I get to do is say yes to something that an artist has envisioned. Um, and this was a long relationship. Like, this was not a quick 10-minute um, excursion that we thought up um, driving in the car, which we tend to do sometimes. Like, we sort of loud of stuff out when we're together. But um, it's been a long relationship and a long time figuring it out, and I think that's also why it worked so well. Is we, we trusted each other, um, and we're willing to work within the systems that we're in. Um, I work at ASU, and I also um, am a project manager for Liz Lerman, and so I'm able to negotiate both the bureaucracy and um, wonder of a big university, because it comes with both. Um, it comes with funding and magic and scary, hard financial systems and stuff like that, and also n navigating a small um, LLC organization that's able to be more nimble. And so because I work in both of those spaces, it was um, easy for us to say yes to a lot of different things in a way that maybe it's, it's not so easy all the time. Um, um, and also because uh, Liz was Yvonne's mentor last year, there was an ability for us to kind of work through some of those um, difficult processes in a more uh, quick and nimble way. And so I think um, also being artists, both Gabrielle and I also have artist practices in our back pockets. I think that also helps us um, understand in a really uh, clear and visceral way what it means to be an artist and what it means to be looking at your checking account saying, I can't pay for this and for us to say, we work at organizations that can and we should, um, and this is the sort of art that really matters, especially in this region. Um, and I think um, in a lot of ways that we've seen, like in the theater world, the Latinx community has, uh, has um, begun to make a, a network and a name for themselves, and we haven't really seen that in dance. And so this is like a really exciting moment, I think, um, nationally for you guys to be like in on the ground level. I think that this gathering may have been the first of its kind, but I'm not quite sure, so. Oh, I get to ask you a question now. Um, oh. So because this was an all Latinx gathering, which we think may have been one of the first of its kind in dance, um, how were the cultural values integrated in both 
the planning process and then and also the implementation and execution of the pilot. I think that you started to touch upon that when you said, no, that's <laughs> fine. I think it's good to, <laughs> to say it multiple times. Um, when you talked about the relationship, so I have a background in Mexican-American studies, and so I taught and, and learned about Mexican-American cultural values. And there's three in particular that I, I really employed um, in Dance in the Desert because it's what I do in my, tu my company in Tucson, personalismo, dignidad, and simpatia. And those are fancy words, and they have their own definitions, but they basically mean that the most important thing for us is genuine relationships mm -hmm. and relationships that happen over time. So um, we, and, and that of, oftentimes involve food and families, right? Um, so really taking the time to get to know each other. Gabriela and I, when we were talking yesterday, she said, you know, we, we started this collaboration over breaking bread. We, were, we went out to lunch together and hang, hung out for about two hours. Um, and just getting to know each other and investing and continuing to return to those relationships over time. So that personalismo, that one-on-one, -on -one, um, Dance in the Desert was by invite only and it was very strongly vetted. Everyone who attended, I had at least one one-hour one-on-one -on -one meeting um, just to talk to them about where they are, what their goals were, what they wanted to, to get, what they wanted to share from a group of colleagues. And then the choreographers that presented their work, I had an additional one-hour meeting. So that investment up front, I think is really important. Um, we also, we had a lot of families come, like Mireya Guerra, who came from Vermont, brought her entire family. My family dro drove up from Tucson for the Pachanga. Um, a lot of us are moms. We have about half the panel up here are moms. We were trick-or-treating last night, some of us. Um, and to, to build space for partners and family to also be there um, and to, to so they feel comfortable and to be able to speak, as you can see now, in multiple languages. Um, those were some of the ways in which we implemented the cultural values, both in the gathering but also in the planning phases. I think that those three values of simpatia, dignidad, personalismo, and respeto, right? Respect, um, that peer-to-peer -peer respect for each other and that trust. We have confianza. Like I, I know that um, behind the scenes, Aaron and Gabriella, they have my back, and I don't worry about if you know something falls through the cracks. I know we got it, um, and I think that in just embedding that throughout is what makes it um, what made it culturally competent, culturally relevant for the Latinx crowd. Yeah. That was beautiful. <laughs> I clearly remember. Um, Actually, when I first met you, it, it kind of it was a very small meeting, and then it was another meeting, and then it was just these encounters that we had together that it just grew into the moment that I ended up getting, in, like, ended up being there. So that was very true in nature. Um, okay, my question is for Reina and Yvonne. Um, so it's very clear that the Southwest and the borderlands has its own aesthetic, and so my question would be, how does dance in the desert? Um, and what does it mean in terms of develop, developing that aesthetic for you guys? Thank you, Ruby. So how many of you were yesterday in the place of politics um, conversation? So a good amount of you. So you kind of get to experience a little bit of hone in about like what Arizona is and what context and what moment are we in right now. But I think it's really important to just name things that exist. Like we, Arizona didn't become a state until 1902. So there were indigenous communities, 1912, which were indigenous communities living here. Also at the same time is that we are becoming a majority minority state, meaning that the largest, um, ethnic group, it's kind of ethnic or um, minority group would be um, the Latinx community. And if you go in into a K through 12 educational system, you will start seeing the demographical shift that we have experienced. We're also the sixth largest um, state with undocumented immigrants in the whole nation. So I think those things are really important to talk about and just understanding about what are the aesthetics that come with it because sometimes we see these statistics in vacuum, but we're talking about people who are living in their own experiences and a lot of art is about really looking into what are your experiences and how does that inform your practice and your creation. So that's something that we were able to really hone in and talk and discuss and just share in confianza, like Yvonne said, in, in community, just to talk about what are some of the challenges, but what are also some of the some of the beauties of resiliency that we see that, yes, we might not be 
uplifted in a specific spaces, but that is pushing us to be more creative in, in really co-creating new spaces like Dance in the Desert for us to really be pushing a new aesthetic that is decolonial, that it's not um, your typical lines. And I think that that's a beautiful energy because that's where innovation happens. That's where a lot of the new ideas or ideas that come from a very uh, background that comes from the elders, that comes from a specific communities that you have implemented or you have been part of, that you're able to really explore and honor. So um, my critique of Tucson contemporary dance stages, and I'll be very specific and say the community that I live and work in, um, is that the movement, its whiteness is very much centered. It's very much a white Eurocentric aesthetic and all the movement looks like it comes from the coast. So I'm very curious about what are our contemporary movement aesthetics for the people that are here um, and that have been here for centuries um, and who this is, this is their homelands. Um, and that includes immigrants, right? So, um, so that, that is what I'm, I'm interested in. And I think that here being on the border, we do have a very unique, um, unique experiences that informs an aesthetic that's different than the Latinx aesthetics that are coming out of New York or the Bay Area. And it's important to support and honor that and also provide the artists that are working in that, those aesthetics the resources to continue to work um, to, to, to create that work. So I have, I actually have a question because of course as arts administrators we do um, close out um, surveys and debriefs and because it was such a large sort of convening and because um, we, um, Aaron and I sort of took a back step. Um, the, the debrief, which usually happens when we have us, when I'm working with a smaller group of artists, happens, tends to happen either in person or over, you know, Zoom. Um, but I, I didn't get to have that moment, so I thought I would have that moment now. Um, and I was wondering, particularly for, for BB and for, for Ruby, like, what were sort of the biggest takeaways for you? Um, for dance in the desert. I mean, BB, I know you, like your investment was fairly great, even though like your costs were your travel and lodging costs were covered. Like taking that time and making it happen in your schedule, and I know it's like a big, it's a big commitment. Um, so I was, I was wondering if you would. Bueno, voy a hablar en español. Um, Creo que uno de, de los grandes aprendizajes que yo, que yo tuve con este programa y quiero agradecerles a estas chicas, fue de que en nuestra comunidad fronteriza en donde vivimos es, es una comunidad muy pequeña, entonces realmente estamos con, con los ojos vendados, no sabemos qué son los recursos que tenemos, ¿no? entonces al, al yo asistir a, este, a, este, a esta junta, de, con estas personas, yo aprendí que no estamos solos, que las comunidades pequeñas, fronterizas, um, no estamos solas y que, y que al final esas barreras que tenemos, así como tenemos la, la barrera fronteriza, literal, uh, todos estamos luchando por, por una misma causa, por un mismo efecto. Entonces, lo que yo aprendí de que todos tenemos diferentes tipos de barreras, pero que al final todas… todas terminan siendo una misma, ¿no? Entonces yo soy creyente de que la unión hace la fuerza y creo que juntas y con la ayuda de todas estas, de todas estas personas puedo ayudar y representar a nuestra comunidad y de que sabemos de que no estamos solos, de que tenemos otras personas con las que podemos aliarnos, unirnos para que um, lo que queremos que cambie o lo que queremos hacer en grande se pueda realizar. Um, otra, otra de las cosas fue, fue que fue aprend de lo que aprendí, perdón, fue, fue de, todas, de todas estas experiencias que tenemos, que tenemos cada quien ¿no? individualmente. Entonces creo que esto que, que están realizando ustedes uh, va a ayudar, absolutamente va a ayudar a la, a la comunidad que es de Douglas y Agua Prieta. Gracias. Oh, también algo, otro que quiero, otra cosa que quiero comentarles es que gracias, después de, de que asistí a este evento, uh, conocí a varias personas 
y pude, pude conseguir lo de um, Kennedy Center. Es, es, un, es, un, um, es un programa, ¿cómo le puedo llamar? Um, es un programa que, que pude conseguir, es una beca, que después de, de asistir a este proyecto um, fue más fácil para mí de, de conseguirlo y de saber que existe, porque realmente en nuestra comunidad estamos ciegos, no sabemos qué es lo que tenemos, las oportunidades, todo lo que podemos conseguir, allá no lo tenemos. Entonces, creo que ahorita para mí es, estoy descubriendo, estoy abriendo mis ojos en qué es lo que podemos um, lograr y conseguir. Gracias. Thank you, Vivi, gracias. Ok, so I'm just going to translate that. So some of Vivi's um, couple takeaways was the fact that Um, the, she comes from a border community, but before she talks about her takeaways, she wants to thank the, the panel and the ladies for being here. One of the main things that she mentioned was about how it really opened up her eyes, because in Douglas specifically, there's not a lot of re resources that exist. So then she feels that there's not a specific um, access or opportunities there. And by being in Dance in the Desert, she felt that she was not alone and that the small border communities do have a lot of barriers, but at the same time, they're not, they're not alone. And, e and there's barriers not only in terms of access, but also the physical wall that already exists there. And just knowing that she doesn't have to fight this alone and we are moving as a whole community to be to be fighting these barriers and that we might have different barriers, but at the end of the day, uh, we are walking to a common purpose and she's a firm believer that unity, by us coming together and forming unity, we are gonna have a lot of strength. Uh, she also says that uh, it really, going back to this, this concept of not being alone and feeling that now she has a community where she can be represented, that she has allies that are gonna be working towards a specific change. And more in the individual experience and something that she was able to take away very literal from the conference was that through the convening, she was able to learn about this opportunity called the Kennedy Center, where she was able to find and obtain a scholarship before she didn't even know it existed. So by being dan in Dance in the Desert, she felt that uh, it really uh, gave a vehicle and an access to know about opportunities that she was blinded to. And she was able to discover this and she feels that this is a very positive change for communities in the borderlands such as Douglas and Agua Prieta. All right, so, um, I actually, I ended up going, I went to school here for four years, and I remember the first time that I met Yvonne, she asked me, it's back to the mentorship question, I was sitting there and I was asking her all these questions, and then she goes and asks me a question, and she says, um, okay, so who in the dance program do you see as your mentor? <laughs> I, sit there, I, I sat there and I started thinking, and, and I was like, um, That is a very good question. Who do I see as my mentor? Um, and then I quickly realized that there was really nobody that I looked up to um, in the dance program in that kind of way. Nobody that I could have conversations with, no one that I was already really seeing as a mentor in, in that kind of way that she was asking me. And so I think um, the biggest thing that I, that I got from this, from doing dance in the desert was that, was, um, being able to know that I can turn to people and ask them questions, or not even having to ask them questions, but rather than coming to me and inspiring me to continue to push forward and do different things. Um, my parents do the best that they can. They're amazing and they're so supportive, but my mom is not gonna um, text me and say, oh, I saw this um, audition online. You should totally audition for it. Here's the email. She's not, you know, she's not, unfortunately, is not going to do that. And so from um, having um, and, and being participating in Dance in the Desert, I was able to get that kind of mentorship. I, I got a text message the other day from somebody saying, hey, Ruby, you should really audition for this. Here's this opportunity. Same thing with getting grants. 
something right now just happened where she gave me her card and she said, hey, make sure that you apply for this. And so I think that um, knowing that these people exist and knowing that I do have a community and feeling that type of community that's growing and um, getting that, gaining that kind of trust. Another, another quick example about how that works is um, I always talk to my dad and I'm like, uh, tell him, would you go to um, a party if you saw an invitation on Facebook? First of all, he doesn't really use Facebook. <laughs> no, he wouldn't receive that invitation. And then second of all, no, he wouldn't. It's going to be when he goes to his soccer game and he plays soccer and he sees uh, you know, his friend and his friend goes, hey, make sure that you come to my son's birthday party. And then my dad will go, okay, you come to my son's birthday party. And then there's, you know, there's a, it's a different kind of relationship, a different kind of trust that we build with one another in community and how we socialize. And that's very, very different than just seeing each other one time in a panel and saying, hey, make sure that you do this or do that. It, it's very much of how we build relationships with one another and how we trust each other and, and how I'm willing to be, you know, to ask you to be the godmother of my future child <laughs> rather than just, you know, um, in passing. So I really, that was one of the biggest things that I gained is knowing that I have, um, you know, these beautiful women and powerful women that I can turn to and ask questions about things that I'm going to um, do in the future or that I'm currently working on. Thank you, Ruby. Yeah, I think that was another goal of Dance in the Desert is for the younger generation to see themselves in the field and see that being a choreographer is a possibility. Because a lot of times when we don't see ourselves in those positions, we don't think it's a reality, especially when we have family members. A lot of us are first generation college students. When we have our family saying, you need to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, and not that dance thing, because you know, um, you're not going to be able to eat. Um, so I want to close out and um, open it up to you all with some questions but before I do that I'm going to do two plugs um, both Reina and Ruby will be performing tonight um, a piece Braceros uh, that's in memory of my father and today is Dia de los Muertos um, he was a migrant farm worker and so there's a there's a piece in honor of him tonight uh, and then we are doing Dance in the Desert 2019 which was directly inspired by the feedback so I did pre-survey, post-survey, and now we're looking at a six-month follow-up because I like to evaluate. Um, so from the information that, I haven't evaluated his background. Um, <laughs> Uh, from the information that informed what 2019 is going to be. So it will be in Tucson. It will be approximately a week long. It's by invite only. We're taking 15 artists, five choreographers, 10 dancers, and we are going to invest in incubating and professional development for our local choreographers. So we'll have a series of professional development workshops led by Liz Lerman. We have James, and I don't remember his last name right now, who's coming, a lawyer, to talk about copyright. We are, we're asking Ana Maria Alvarez to come, so fingers crossed. I haven't had a conversation with her yet, but I will tomorrow. Um, and we're going to invest in, in really incubating and supporting the work of those choreographers. So um, I'm going to open up the floor. Do any of y'all have questions? And then also, I don't know if we can get some lights up in the house because it, you're really hard to see, and I want to be able to see you. Um, so yeah, any questions for any of us? Great question. Thank you so much for the support as well. Um, so for those of you who do not know, Aliento is a community-based organization that we uh, work in the intersection between arts, education, and immigration. And a lot of people always think about like politics is so abstract, it's in Washington DC, or it's so far removed from your daily lives. But for example, me as a DACA, undocumented immigrant who grew up here in Arizona, it's something that I can just have the luxury not to think about. That's something that I'm constantly thinking out every single day. 
So in terms of like the relationship with that is like, uh, being a dancer after I graduated from Arizona State University, I actually ended up dancing professional here in Phoenix, Arizona. And I was really thrilled to see that people were kind of like starting to push the envelope, but that died down really quickly. And we started going back to the aesthetics of, of whiteness and something that I just couldn't relate. And I, and I joke around and I respect all, all dance forms, but I wanted something more. I don't want to be a kitty cat dancing or a vampire, which is awesome, right? And like props to the people who want to do that. But I want something more. And I was just really disappointed about the lack of depth and I mean like there's there's so much more that we can actually value right and there's a place for that and I love entertainment but what is the other spaces and why are they not being created and why are we not connecting why do we have to dance in the desert be the first time that that it is intentional for us to connect so I really appreciate the leadership of Yvonne and the people who supported that but at the same time it is really sad the fact that it's just happening, right? And now I'm like, I'm about to turn 28, so also thinking about how do I dance and how do I relate and how do I create work, but have actually a community that is gonna understand the struggle, that is gonna understand where I'm coming from and that my vision is gonna be read and, and that I'm gonna be pushed and grow, not only as a dancer, choreographer, but as a human being. leadership is really hard because that means you have to listen which is <laughs> hard it's hard to listen um, it's hard to listen without um, the intention of responding immediately um, and so I think um, it's practice and I think it's also why why we choose our partners so carefully because it's also something that's modeled and um, if you see it modeled, then it, it forces you, it, it allows you to recognize the moments in which there is a misstep. Um, so for me, I really value um, service. I consider myself a public servant, like that is how I approach my work. And as an artist, I love learning. It's one of the great privileges of my work that I get to learn in the act of doing my job. Um, and so I think centering those two things is, um, has been really important for me. And we don't always get it right. And so that's why those relationships are so important, right? Relationships move at the speed of trust. And when you have that trust, then you're able to have a misstep in that process. And, and, and your, your partners will meet you with grace if that is returned. And so I think like centering reciprocity and also really um, trying really hard to leave the ego, um, like one's ego to the side and making sure that you, like the folk that need to be centered are being centered, that those needs, right, um, are being respected, that you're respecting the expertise and valuing um, the local expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and augmenting that by connecting it to like national and international expertise is really wonderful, but it really has to, it has to be like for community by community. Um, and it often means like for us, because we serve statewide, it means a lot of travel. So I'm actually now um, like really familiar with Douglas because I, travel there quite often. I've like taken my, my baby there because I was gonna be away for like four days. And so like it takes, yeah, it's an investment. Um, I think if you're asking artists to trust you, it's really important to like reciprocate with that trust. Um, and then like 
partners. For me, like partners are key. Um, and Aaron is such an amazing <laughs> collaborator. I mean, that is exactly how I would frame it. Um, there is truly uh, collaboration, but it's hard. It's really, really hard. And we don't always agree on everything. One thing I want to add that you touched a little bit upon um, is that she asked me, what are you interested in? What do you think the community needs? And then I went and asked the community, like, well, what, all, what do you want? You know, what's next? I, that, their information helped inform Dance in the Desert. So we have that dialogue and, and that reciprocity. So it isn't, hey, we have this wonderful program that we're going to do now. So I'm going to get you artists and you go out into the community. So it's a different type of model. It takes longer, but it's much more effective in my opinion. I just have one last thing to add. Um, I think also, um, yes to everything, and like a really deep sense of trust and also the willingness to put in the time. Um, I think we started these conversations many, many years ago, like back when NDP was here a couple years ago, um, Ivana and I like first had a conversation about this idea. Um, and like being willing to spend a lot of time together, like our phone calls are not short um, because we spend a bunch of time talking about like what happened with their kids and <laughs> me having a weird surgery. And like also, you know, like the, the best memory I have of like our relationship, well not the best, but one of the best is I was traveling abroad and um, had scheduled a call with them because I was like, I'm working, it's fine. And these two women are like, get off the phone, go sightsee. <laughs> like just, they, like, it's a relationship that we really want to know everything about each other, not just work stuff, it's also like life stuff. And so we really have, um, spent a lot of time developing those sort of relationships, which is hard. Like, I think spending the time to make those relationships work um, is a, a big investment, um, but I think it's the only way to make these sort of things really horizontal in a true way because we do each step in and step out of different things, and it's okay because we all trust each other. Um, and, like, we will take each other's calls at 9 p.m. at night or, like, text each other over the weekends and it's fine because we have that relationship where it's not it's not just work it's about um a deep friendship and a deep collegiality as well so Hi, Kimmy. I can't see you. It's so dark out there. Um, yes, we recognize, I recognize a lack of scholarship about Latinx dance makers overall, a lack of archival work of Latinx dance makers overall, and a lack of th those records in the Southwest as well, like the Southwest dance community is under-researched. Um, so there's two kind of things that are not working in our favor here. We are starting the process of documentation. I recently wrote a scholarly article, which I haven't done in 13 <laughs> years, actually, um, and presented at the Gloria Anzaldúa conference, El Mundo Sordo, with the Decolonial Epistemologies Lab. I'll be working with um, Michelle Tellez, who's a scholar in Mexican-American studies at the University of Arizona, to, to co-create and document some of the work that we're doing. Um, and we are in the pro we're very mindful of that, and we're in the process of developing that. I also. The other thing that Reina and I were talking about earlier is it is complicated because there's no single Latinx experience and we recognize that the aesthetics that are gonna come out of this work and practice will be different, very unique and very specific to an individual's experiences. So it's being, um, making sure that we go in intentionally holding space for the multiplicity of voices and that may, so the scholarship may look different. Um, and we also want to work outside of traditional dance paradigms that may not have provided space for Latinx or dance makers of color in the past and work towards creating our own paradigm for documentation and talking about what, what high aesthetics mean to our community. So 
Yeah, so the first gathering, the Nago gathering, was just a platica. So we came together, we did share work, um, and I was pushing for a culturally competent way of giving and receiving feedback because I don't think that the existing models really work for Latinx communities and the way in which we create relationships with each other. Um, so we, we piloted and tested that, um, and work was shown. I did show some pieces, and, and Ruby showed a piece as well, um, but we didn't have a lot of the dance making practice, which is why Dance in the Desert 2020 is solely about the choreography. Yeah, so we had discussions about what we think it meant and where we think it needs to go, and we did have the master class, and so it was sprinkled in, but this next iteration will be a really deep dive into it, and I'll be able to better answer that question next year at this time. Yeah, but thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Hi, everybody. I guess you met Gabriella, probably. My name is Jonathan Clark, uh, all the way from Knoxville, Tennessee, at the Carpetbag Theater. Um, you probably didn't expect Gabriella and I to know each other, but we do through a uh, little large gathering, actually, called the Intercultural Leadership Institute. Uh, anybody, anybody, most, are y'all familiar? Anybody? Well, the intercultural leadership, Gabriella, you wanna you wanna explain it? Yeah, I mean, I I will just start by saying that Jonathan could have texted me last night to let me know we were gonna do this thing today. <laughs> that um, surprise, surprise. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start by um, talking a little bit about my connection to Ely. So. I've been working with the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture for a long time, since I was a grad student, a prank grad student here, actually. And I reached out because I really needed, um, formally, I was getting some like great feedback content-wise for my work. I really needed, I needed more. And so I actually reached out, and it was amazing. They are, they support in a, in a real way. And so I've been working with them for quite a while. And they are one of the um, national funders that have decided to invest and bring together a cohort of 30 um, art practitioners, cultural practitioners from around the country. So it's a partnership between um, NALAC, um, the Pai Foundation in Hawaii, um, First Peoples Fund based out of the Pine Ridge Reservation, and Alternate Roots. Which is an organization that I'm a part of. Uh, and a member of the executive committee. Um, so it's pretty amazing how this connection happened, but uh, this is one of the ways that we actually were able to get uh, Dance in the Desert here, was to understand like, hey, we, we know some people in common, and maybe we should talk and see how this works. So I, uh, I definitely, we talked, we actually met by accident, mm -hmm. again, in rural Kentucky, in Berea, yeah. Yeah. which was amazing, like to walk into the hotel room, or the hotel lobby, and see Gabriella sitting at the, in the front lobby, just hanging out. I was like, what in the world are you doing here? <laughs> um, so seeing her come from Arizona, and I'm coming from Tennessee, and we meet yeah. in Kentucky after Illy had uh, ended officially, right? Was that it? For that us. I mean, there was, us, a new, yeah. there was a new cohort, actually, that's There's a new cohort going on, which Joe now. Talbert is actually part of. Ooh. 
Uh, you didn't know that, did you? I did that's, not. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> but we're, uh, it's crazy how this connection happened, and we were able to share the work that we both were doing and understand that this work is important enough to, to bring to you all, and this is important enough to, be, to spread the word about it, but also to understand how interculturality works and how we, uh, how we begin to show up for each other, like how we take care of each other when some people probably maybe aren't taking care of us. We have to kind of take care of ourselves, but also when we have the, the, the privilege of being in a position, just like Gabriella, putting, putting herself out there and saying, hey, I'm, I have to fund the work that, that needs to be shared and the work that needs to be done. These are the kind of things that we can help each other with and how we can continue the work and make it all happen and make sure that you guys are aware of it because everybody's not aware. And if you don't know, then you don't get to support it. So that's how this works. Yeah, absolutely. I think like the power of um, what you mentioned, like showing up for each other mm -hmm. and and showing up for one another, even when, like when that person isn't in the room. That um, being allies for one another is is really important. Yeah. And we see the fruits of it every time we do things like this and show up in each other's states. I don't get to Arizona a lot, but I'm glad I'm here. Um, but also, we, uh, it was kind of interesting, Yvonne talked about uh, the, the search for leadership and uh, mentorship, and I think that's a big thing that we, we really have to start being more mindful about, is to go ahead and start bringing the next generation down the right pathway. Yeah. And that's kind of what our next session is about, as we see, how, see what I did there, that's how this Thank works. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> I can do mics. I'm just going to move forward. Um, so this uh, is Success in Succession, and the full title, I don't remember the full title off the top of my head. Putting the Success in Succession. Yeah. Let's, see, let's see what, I forgot what we called it. I forgot what we wrote. Where is it? There Show she's ready. Show she's ready before you. Success in Succession, Next Generation Leaders Sharing Stories, Struggles, and Strategies. Um, all of us are leaders uh, within our own separate organizations that are all NET members, and we were just going to start off with a little bit of an introduction as to who we are. And since you're sitting here, can you talk first? You get to go first. <laughs> all right. Well, hello again. <laughs> Seems like so long since we've been together. Um, so, of course, again, my name is Jonathan Clark. Uh, I am the executive support manager at the Carpetbag Theater. Um, my boss and woman tour, I like to call her, is Linda Paris Bailey. Um, right, yeah, give, give it up for Linda Paris Bailey. Um, we, all, I, we all kind of realize that we share something fairly similar here. I started with Carpetbag Theater when I was 13 years old uh, in our youth program. Uh, I turned 33 in August, so officially 20 years with the Carpetbag Theater. Um, so that was something that I think that's one of the big things that we all have in common sitting here is that we're all part of organizations that have been around for a very long time. And um, we're here as, as people who've been part of those organizations in almost every um, c capacity that we could be part of, right? Like it's, we've been the, the young kids that have to be babysat and <laughs> we've been the, the young, even the young adults that are trying to perform and be part of the productions and then the adults who um, could really use more treatment as adults. Um, <laughs> you, it's like, oh, you can't make decisions, you're 27. Um, but <laughs> even in those growing up, and it's almost like we, we just wanted that trust. Are there any, uh, by a show of the hands that I can see maybe, or if you're able uh, to let us know, like anybody, are, are, is, are there organizations that you're working with who are going through kind of the similar 
um, struggles of transition. Okay, so fair amount, a fair amount. Um, but this, this really is supposed to be the conversation that um, maybe helps uh, and lets you know you're not alone in the struggle. It's, not a, it's a common thing that's going around right now um, to transition. I don't know what happened with the generation uh, there's the baby boomers, and the, the boomers kind of have the, the arts organizations that they started and began with in the 60s and 70s, and then uh, it's like there was not a lot going on with the next generation, and then our generation came along, and then it was, <laughs> it's a joke. It's just kidding. It's just kidding. But there's, <laughs> and then the organizations come along that are like 20-somethings, and those organizations come along, and even those organizations are looking to transition leadership. So that's kind of where we are now, like the organizations that have maybe 60 or 70 something years old leaders, and then the 40 somethings, and then the 20 somethings are kind of in that, in the, in the same positions now. So we're all looking for ways to better transition and make transition a little bit easier. So that's where we want to put the success in succession, uh, as, it, as it sounds. So that's what we're here for. Um, and I think it's also especially um, special in this container, in this community, um, in watching the people that stayed standing yesterday who are from the very original beginnings of the network of ensemble theaters. And um, we were all talking like, oh, so when did Eric start? When did Linda and, and Stacy? And what are those histories? Um, so to come in as the kind of, and we don't quite have a word for this yet, what that next round is, which is different than, than coming in with a new company, but what is it to be dropped in the center of, of something that's already created and had a lifetime and is um, still, it, we called it a maze when we were talking about it on this phone call that we were thinking about things. So it's like, instead of starting at the beginning of the maze and kind of carving what kind of path one takes, you're dropped in the center and it's been done a certain way for a long period of time, and cho choosing a new path is a, is, has its issues and has its um, challenges. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Shoshana Bass, <laughs> and um, I was born into uh, the culture of Sandglass Theater that my parents founded in Germany in 82, and then relocated to Vermont in 86. And um, about seven years ago, I moved back to Vermont after finishing school and working with a company in Colorado for a while because I realized that I'd been out in the world looking for exactly what was at home. It was like one of those alchemist stories. Um, <laughs> and I was, yeah. So, I, and I really wanted to participate and work with my parents directly while they were still actively leading the work and doing the work. Um, at that time, there wasn't an assumption of succession. There wasn't an assumption that I would come back and take up the family business. That seemed kind of an old world idea. Um, and nothing that my parents ever pushed on me, or actually they probably tried to push me in another direction that maybe was a little more secure. <laughs> um, Dentistry, I think, is what they suggested. <laughs> um, but my sister and I have both become very much involved with the theater, and um, in the last four years or so, this has become a uh, very large topic of conversation, and um, something that I think there was a, a total openness for my parents, I think, for Sandglass to just clothes and take the banjo and walk off into the countryside and uh, move on and let it go. And um, suddenly there's these other conversations happening and, and people who have stepped forward to say, no, I see what this is for our community. I see the connections in the, on a national level and an international level and why it's important and where I want to be part of it. And um, I think it's, it's exciting, it's scary, it's, and the only reason that I myself have, oh, we're now looking at, my father and I are um, going to share artistic leadership for the next two years, um, and with that runway kind of transition the organization. And the only thing I think that really affirmed that decision for me had to do with 
these kind of connections and these kind of connections and the communities of net the, co the communities of the puppetry community, the communities of the theater ensemble community, um, the mentorship that I have found in that, the mentorship that I found through my friends and allies in my generation that gave me access to um, the, the mentors of these other wonderful people. All of that, I think, made it possible for us to, to dream that this is even a possibility. Hello, my name is Cariel, um, Cariel Klein. I am the associate producer at Double Edge Theater. Um, I am also the daughter of the founder and artistic director, Stacy Klein. I have, uh, I did this in an order. Uh, Jonathan has worked at Carpetbag for 13, oh no, sorry, for 20 years. You started when you were 13. Uh, Shoshana has worked at Sandglass for seven years, and I have worked at Double Edge for two. Um, I'm also the youngest out of the three of us. And these two people were mentors to me when I started coming to these conferences. Um, of my same age group, they were people who were like, these are the people you should hang out with. I've known Shoshi for quite some time. I met Jonathan last year. And they're people who uh, I have, uh, the three of us I've seen, come together in different situations. Uh, we did another conference together over the summer at Double Edge, um, and we've sort of been seeing a need in these ensembles for this kind of discussions, and for our presence, and for our work together. Um, I'm slightly a little bit, my position is slightly different from Jonathan and Shoshi's, um, because I come from Double Edge that's quite a bit larger uh, than these two organizations, just in terms of the amount of people. Um, the ensemble itself is 13. I am not a member of the ensemble, I'm a company member. Um, the difference is, is that the, there's a sort of position of artistic uh, legacy um, and I come into the producing legacy. So I do a lot of the logistical work, even though I do perform, it's not, uh, there are generations of legacies being trained at Double Edge. So for instance, when Stacy and Carlos, who are co-artistic directors, retire, the next generation will be Jennifer Johnson and Matthew Glassman, who will lead artistically at the theater. And I am being trained for a producing leadership role. Um, so that that is a little bit different from both of you in that you are both being trained for all of it. Like you are both artistic and producing. Whereas I, uh, ensemble meetings at Double Edge get, uh, uh, like, and I, I attend ensemble meetings even though I'm not part of the ensemble. And that is because there is an, a realization that producing it has an ensemble role. Um, and you can't really separate in, in these kinds of work. You can't really separate one from the other. You really need to work together. Um, but uh, we tr sort of do it in a little bit different way. Um, it's a little spread out. Uh, and thus, I also have different membership, uh, sorry, different members within my organization that I can ask for different uh, things but it wasn't quite the same, and I didn't feel like I had anybody within my organization who was going through the things that I feel like Shoshana and Jonathan are going through. Yeah. I'd just like to say, like, um, we did yesterday during the opening discussion that if people have things to say in the midst of this, we don't need to formally wait until the end. So, totally. And we can't see you very well, so a little auditory, like, woo, or something like that. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> yes. Um, so the question was, or the, and the, um, I have also other ones. The, um, the prompt was to hopefully speak a little bit about what this community can do or be to support us in these, or those of you out there who are also dealing with these transitions. I have an answer just because I spent some time last night uh, with Lisa Mount uh, talking about this. And it's you, a good idea. right? It's always a good idea to spend some time there. Um, uh, when I came to the table, 
uh, I was not supposed to come back to Double Edge. I, there was no plan where I was to be a full-time person at Double Edge. I was coming back because someone in the organization was having a baby and they needed someone to produce a show. And they called me and said, do you have six weeks? Can you come back and just do this and then you can leave? And that didn't really work out, I just stayed. Uh, <laughs> when I came back, what I, I thought of was that nobody, uh, I and this was the conversation last night, is when you're working in multi-generations, uh, I don't have the, the sort of organizational and general uh, generational wisdom of the people who are much older than me, but I work at a very different speed and sometimes I see things in a new way. And coming to the table, knowing that someone is gonna be at their, that table with a completely different uh, perspective and response, but treating it with respect and like listening it out and not throwing it out of hand was, is so important. Because the first thing you can do to shut down a conversation uh, and sort of to stop a, a mentorship and uh, someone's role in, or in an organization is to treat them like they don't know. And you're trying to sort of foster respect and sort of also ownership in that person so that they can lead. You really want to make sure they feel like they can add. I think, of course, the obvious question that is um, for anyone in these transitions has Goethe, one of my favorite Goethe quotes is, there's two things that parents should give their children, roots and wings. Mm -hmm. And I always love that, and for me it is, it is actually my parents, but whether it's your parents or not, the, um, the organization as it's passed on, what is the responsibility in terms of carrying forward what the root missions are of that organization, the root aesthetics, or which, where are the choices of what is really honored and held on to, and what has, how to provide the freedom for new voices to come up, for new mediums to be explored. And, um, you know, in conversations with, with my parents, it's, that we have a clear form that we work in, but even that is flexible. Even that is, yes, but you're a dancer and, and we aren't. So, so make it dance and puppetry, whatever. Like, make it your own medium. What is it you're saying? What is the passion behind it? Um, as long as you feel you have voice and you are collecting the people with you that you want to work with, that you feel can move culture together, that's what it should be. Um, which I think is, is a very generous thing to say. I think I, we've been talking about turning the question back around on our elders to say, what is it that you need from us in this transition? And um, how, how can we facilitate that so that all people are feeling honored? Because it's not always a graceful thing. It's, there is a lot of attachment. There's a lot of um, this kind of idea of needing to kill the teacher a little bit, right? And, well, the, that's the martial arts term. It's not literal. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Step in. <laughs> um, I just wrote down a couple of things that, that's uh, what Shoshana talked about. We, um, that was one of the things that, uh, just asking what you need from us, honestly, is, is one of the biggest things. I asked, I, I was talking to Carla Perlo um, a couple of years ago. And I told her what was going on in transition. Um, and Carpet Bag, we've actually set a, a, a fairly um, long transitional period of three years um, to make it to make this transition as smooth as possible. And it's I mean, there's still a lot of a lot of um, speed humps and all those good things that are that get that slow down the process. But it's also a lot quicker to it's a, a lot quicker to learn and understand and also develop a vision. Uh, in collaboration with our leaders. Um, so what Carla said that what she would have loved um, in transition was uh, six, six things that she could request from transitioning that would be, those expectations would be met um, and she would have felt a more comfortable transition exiting from her position. And that just struck me. I didn't, I asked Linda for, I asked Linda for five to 10 things. I didn't want to limit uh, her, her, need. I didn't want to say, you have to tell me six things and put it all in there. I said five to ten things that you need from me to feel comfortable to transition. 
um, whatever role, whatever role you want to play when this is when the transition is is concrete, um, then that's what I need to know. Those are the things that I'd like to figure out so that I can make sure that this is as graceful as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm still I'm st still I, I, I didn't give her a time limit. I didn't give her a, a set date to give me these things by, which I don't have that that power or authority. <laughs> it's like you give me this now, but it's a. Uh, for, for me, it was to really have expectations set and to understand that this is what I expect um, for the legacy that you should keep. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be taking over a 50-year-old organization, and I'm 33. So it's not, I, I don't, I, I, there's, there's a respect and an homage that needs to be paid to the organization um, for our founders. Linda's actually not the founder of Carpetbag. But she's been around for 42 years. I don't. I don't think she would mind me telling you guys that. <laughs> um, but also, one thing that has been really, really amazing um, is open doors. Um, I've I've been privileged enough to sit in on conversations with elders, with people who are are doing this work for and have been for decades, and just being I'm just being a fly on the wall in those conversations and. Being able to sit, I remember uh, last last gathering, um, sitting in a conversation with Mina, uh, DePonker, uh, Jerry Stropnicki, and Linda Paris Bailey, and sitting, I, I felt so honored to be sitting in this room with these these people that mean so much to me, but also asking what I think about something. And at the time, I think I was 31 or 32, like just. It, it just blew my mind to be sitting with these people and to 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 have an opinion that's valued and to to not feel like I'm the kid at the the kids table at the holiday dinner like that's really I think a lot of organizations have that have that mode of putting young people like in their place I guess but it's it was really it, it just made me want to work harder it made me want to to uphold the values that they have set. It just made me really want to pay honor to the people who've done this and the legacy that they've, they've already put forward. And I think that's one of the biggest ways to transition is to make sure that that legacy is honored, but to also value the opinions of the, the young people who are coming next. Like find out what, what we can do and find, let's collaborate and figure out some things together. Like Jerry's giving me an idea for a play that I'm, I'm gonna work on and he's just take it here. I don't, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it, you do it. And, just for somebody to hand you something like that and to and to run with it, and that's the that's the biggest thing, just to, to give collaboration and guidance when we need it. I think that's the those are the the largest things is just to be upfront with the expectations and to to be there when we need you, but also let us get, give us roots and give us wings. So that's the, the biggest thing for us, I think. Since you mentioned Jerry Stropnicki, um, because we were talking <laughs> about two parts of this. The, the legacy being sometimes organizational and in the capacity of producing and carrying forward the, the, um, the events that we, we do in our own communities and that kind of element. And then there's also the artistic legacy and the artistic transference and what that is. Um, and for us I in my family, because we are also a family and um, things are very close, and in the passing of that artistic work, it became very important to resource from the wider network, um, you know, so it doesn't get too, well, you can imagine. <laughs> so, um, so at the NET gathering in Maine, Jerry was reading letters of uh, love letter correspondences between his parents at the conference, and in that moment I was thinking, and here I am investigating these stories um, that have to do with my family and family storytelling and, and, and making work out of that. And to find my voice, my father needs to leave the room and, and be gone for some of that um, because I respect his work so much that I would stop listening to myself. Um, so that moment was very clear of, oh, Jerry, come live with us for three months and help facilitate these family conversations and be my director for this show. And it came directly out of this network. It came directly out of the way um, we witnessed things being honored like that. And um, it was interesting, I also want to say, like, and this is the nature of, of how this works together, is when Jonathan 
learned this thing from Carla. He then shared it with me, so, and I went and asked my dad, so what are the six things you want? And uh, so these things get passed along the line. And one of the things my father said, um, among many other things, was um, I, I don't want you to do it for me. And oh, oh, it's gonna make me cry. <laughs> oh, oh, that's unexpected. Because I think, of course I'm doing it for him. Uh, of course. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> Um, I want to, I think this brings up an important point that there's emotion in this. Yeah. Like there's a lot of emotion because this isn't like you're taking over a company. You're taking over somebody's life's work. And this is like a lot to hold, both because you want change, but you also have a history. And in, I mean, I'd say Linda's family. I mean, this is not like someone you don't see, uh, or just a job that you show up nine to five, this is what we do, and this is what we were raised in, and this is what we care about. So when I make change, or when I rock the boat, it's a family rocking the boat. It's, and it ripples not just in our organizations, but to other organizations and to our friends, and so there is emotion. Yeah, <laughs> Jonathan just said you can't just fire us, but I mean, <laughs> There's that. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's true. There's, there's so much uh, emotion and love and respect and also anger. Um, I see a hand from Claudia, I think. So uh, the question from Claudia is, how were we cultivated um, to be groomed as leaders for, this organi for these organizations, our respective organizations that will be taken over? Um, or not. Or not. Uh, <laughs> honestly, for me, it was just seeing um, and being, being allowed, like I said earlier, like just having those open doors into these conversations. It's it's been a really interesting journey to, to go from a 13-year-old um, with this world in front of, just being placed in front of me to learn that I can create a script out of stories that come from uh, my peers and my friends. And then like we, uh, we, we started a, a group that was, um, we were introduced to the Black Law Students Association at the University of Tennessee. And what came out of the collaboration as a partnership was um, we, we put, we, we turned a mock trial, we learned of mock trial from these, from these younger folks in, in college um, and then turned a mock trial into a play where we put hip hop on trial for crimes committed against humanity, um, which was really cool because we talked like, just going through this, there was eight of us I think at the time, so we got to, we got to collaborate with the Law Students Association who was teaching us about law and how these things worked and how trials worked. And, and, and it was like our leaders just kind of stepped back and pushed us to the partnership and said, no, these kids are doing this. Like, you're, you talk to them. You don't talk to us. We don't need you to be in that position. So it was understanding, like, how to, how to build partnerships at, at 13 and 14 years old and how to speak. And, and uh, like, when we, when we put hip hop on trial, the young people that we were with brought up song lyrics to, there's a, there's a song, I don't know if y'all familiar with football, University of Tennessee, but Rocky Top is my alma mater, um, which the Rocky Top talks about sex and alcohol and moonshine and all these things. And it's like, okay, so you put hip hop on trial for uh, put, talking about women and talking about um, violence and talking about these things. But the song that you play before every football game and the song that everybody gets excited about talks about sex with sex on a mountaintop and and making moonshine which is illegal and you want to tell us that hip hop is ruining the society and we we 
it was it was really interesting. We opened a lot of people's eyes to that conversation, but that wouldn't have happened if it was just our our leaders saying, here's what they're going to learn from you. It came out of real conversations, and it just allowed us to, to be adults, like to be looked at as adults and allowed us to be seen as, as peers instead of just little kids wanting to put on a production. <laughs> so that was, I think, with, with cultivating that, seeing how that was done as a 13, 14, 15-year-old and still being invited into the room co going forward and now um, with the Intercultural Leadership Institute, like Linda has really made it a point to push me into these opportunities and tell me you need to do this. And I'm, I'm, it was like, uh, now, now it's like, okay, what do I need to do? But before, I, like, I wasn't even gonna apply for the Intercultural Leadership Institute. And then I, I didn't think I was, I honestly just didn't think I was gonna be, I was like, they're, it's, they're picking people from all around the country. Like why in the world would they pick me of 30 people from all around the country? And it, and it happened, and it was, but it was because she pushed me and because she said, this is what I should do. Even for the, uh, the executive committee at Alternate Roots, she pushed me and said, you should do this. I think it's a good idea. I think it's a great opportunity for you, and you can learn a lot that we can bring back to the organization. So just pushing me to be part of these um, leadership programs and pushing me out there and letting people know and bringing me, grabbing me by the hand and bringing me into the room when I don't want to wake up at 7.30 in the morning but that's the like literally dragging me, not kicking and screaming, but maybe like shuffling and moaning and groaning. <laughs> I did, I did some things I didn't want to do, but but really she's she has the foresight to understand this is what needs to happen and this is how you're gonna learn. <laughs> I didn't have a choice. Yeah. I don't know if I was so much. Um, helped to know how to be in that role because I wasn't expecting to be involved in Double Edge. I, like Shoshana, I was sort of pushed to not be in Double Edge. Like I'm one of four siblings, three of which now still work for Double Edge. Um, I, I'd like to say that's a coincidence, it's really not. It's the culture that you create with your organization will attract and people who want to stay with that organization. Um, and if you aren't cultivating that, I think that's something to look at and to be like, okay, why aren't people, you know, why is it so transient? Um, I was raised, in a sense, by a lot of you in the room. Uh, I am, my process as an adult is re-meeting people who knew me when I was very small. And the people who are laughing are some of the people who knew me when I was small. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, uh, my, I, I don't remember them, but it's that culture and community that sort of was like letting me be in the room as a child and then also having conversations around me that, and letting me be uh, precocious and sort of out of line, but also like giving me guidance and feedback. And, and that was what I think cultivated me to be who I am in my organization. Um, I mean, one of many, many aspects. Um, I think that if you are raised in these communities, there's something to be said about the, the raising, the long-term, like I don't think I'm ever gonna stop learning. I don't think it, anyone in any of our organizations ever stops learning. Like once you hit, it's not like you hit, you know, artistic director and you're done. That's, that's not how this works. <laughs> like you still learn every day and as long as you're willing to continue that cultivational process, um, I think that that's what, what helped me grow and also the people around me grow to accept me. I really agree with that. The, it, it's a village, right? And it takes a village. And we had artists coming in and out of our home, our private home through my entire childhood from all over the world, from all over the country. And as uh, Sandglass got more connected with Net and with NPN and with these organizations that are really working in um, social movements as well, that became a part of the kitchen experience, you know, of just sitting around with, with these people and um, Linda staying at our house telling me, you will find your people. And um, different thi little bits that have come um, to make the world both smaller and bigger at the same time. And something that I would say is part of that um, I don't know if grooming is the, it's a, it's 
you feel like a dog. But um, <laughs> it's the, the, what I've witnessed and, and what that's um, taught me has a lot to do with watching the amount of creativity in a changing world and the adaptation that has have to happen again and again and again to continue to survive and to continue to adapt to a world in which things move at a, a quicker and quicker pace and become more and more immediate and more and more um, uh, in, in our direct communities and, and feel m like there's a pressure building, right? And situations that changed. Touring in the 80s was a completely different scenario when we were all on the road together than it is now. Um, and to watch how specifically Sandglass has dealt with all those changes in the creativity of, of two people's minds and, th and then the rippling community from there um, instills a sense of bring it on, like we can do anything all together. And that has to do with these networks and the support that we have in that. Um, and, and so it also brings up like the, the, the shifts and changes. Like we haven't really talked about the, the challenges and, and the difficult moments of these transitions and the things that um, are, are different situations, different technologies, different all these things that, that develop that we have a different experience from our elders and, and have certain opinions about. And uh, Claudia, I was actually thinking about this, um, this consensuality and the asking for permission in this particular instance because there is a really difficult balance of how long do you keep asking for permission? How long do you keep needing the approval in order to make the decision? And at some point, you don't. And you just create, and something happens. And I'm gonna swear and say, and sometimes you really fuck it up. Like, sometimes you do that, make that mistake, and then it's about the community supporting you through that. And I think you all have to, like all of us both, you know, the, the next generation and the newer people have to be like, yeah, it's okay. Like, this was a bad, but we're gonna figure it out. Like, you made a mistake. Like, for, you forgot to make a program for a show the day before, or like, because you reproduced the first time you produced a show, or like, you know, you forgot to get a house for a guest that's coming, and like it, there's little things that matter, but like, it's how you deal with it together. So the question was, what is our all's vision? Uh, for me, I've really tried to go. That's uh, one thing, being a part of these cohorts and the professional development um, and being able to travel. Like last year, I was on the road for like 110 days out of the year. Um, and most of those days, I haven't had a vacation until last week since I started with Carpet Bag, like restarted technically with Carpet Bag. Um, but for me, I really want to invest in young people. I realized that there's a, a trend where young people don't pay much attention to theater uh, and kind of see it as a, maybe a dead art form. If it's not on a phone and we're not looking down at it, then it can't be cool. Um, and I really want to stray away from that. Like I, I'm, I, a couple when we were in uh, Seattle, we had the conversation about uh, technology and incorporating technology into our performances, and I nearly had a panic attack. I'm, I'm going to be honest, because I, it just went so far, and it just was so disconnected. And I think that's really what we're what we're trying to avoid. And, and 
especially when, we, when Park comes up later and talks about this connector app. We're trying to, to make sure that we are connecting people again, like make sure that we can sit next to people in an audience and still see these shows and this art form that I've been enthralled with since I was, well, I know definitely at 13, but I was performing since five or six, seven years old. But just being enthralled with this art form and seeing what it can do to change the people who are in the room, you can't get that through a screen. And I really want to make sure that young people understand that. And I really want to invest in our young people and say that we're, there's, there's things that you can do if you want to incorporate dance, if you want to incorporate poetry. I know you like video games, but maybe we can figure out a way to put something like that on a, on a, on a stage instead of a screen. Like, I'm, I'm not anti-screen. I use my phone sometimes. It's not, it's not, it's kind of a necessity for navigating this, this world that we're in now. But I understand when to put my phone away and to, to be part of what's going on and feel and touch and connect with the people that are around me. So really enforcing that and giving young people a way to, to, to connect and to be part of, the, I mean, to be the future patrons for the, the work that we're doing. Like if they don't see it, then it doesn't matter. So it's, it's definitely gotta happen. And that's, that's really the goal of where I wanna go with, with Carpet Bag is to invest in young people and create the leaders of the, of the future. Yeah, I think connection is the key term for, for me as well, and it has to do with um, the needs that we have in our own very local community and the roots that go very deeply locally in terms of working with youth and working with demographics in our region and a changing demographic, and what it means to be a rural organization, which we haven't really gotten into, which um, Kariel and I both have very strong experience of that, and there's a lot of dangers to, to becoming very isolated, both in the way we practice and in, um, in just the resources we have. And so this, these are, again, the moments that, that continue to hold us accountable for our work in the world, continue to inspire our work in the world, and continue to support the work so that these local initiatives become all the stronger with these national networks and even international networks. So those kind of connections, and we have a very changing demographic in our local region. If you look in the school populations, they look very, very different than the adult populations. And the problem that we face is that the, the youth in the community don't have the elders that look like them to look up to. So it is absolutely essential, and it's a big part of our work to be bringing those people into our community that can speak to an experience or, or give voice to something that um, that the students can see themselves represented in or at least engage with. And um, so that's a big part of, of why that connection is so important. And, um, and, and just in a time where truth seems completely irrelevant, it, I mean, what else can we do but continue to search for that and continue to be absolutely committed to, to trying to give space for that speak for ourselves and, and really do that in a way that is connected and together and continues that path even in the darkest of times. Uh, so I have an answer for myself and for my plan with Double Edge, which is that um, Double Edge is 36 years old um, and we're looking at our 40th anniversary coming up. And in my role, I mean, I have a 10 year plan, 10, plus year plan, which is that I want Double Edge to be a fully sustainable, uh, fully, uh, we are able to pay our artists a living wage uh, organization uh, in the next uh, 10 years, hopefully less, but you know, we, you know, five to 10 years, that's what I want to have happen. In the next year, um, I grew up, and, and this is where the theater is on a, in this converted dairy farm, there's no cell phone service. It's in the middle of Western Massachusetts. You are isolated when you are there, um, and you are doing what you're doing when you head there. Like you're not, there's no distractions really because you don't really have a choice. Um, and what I want to do is to make, in my personal interest that I've recently been exploring more is, I want to really broaden the ability for artists to come to Double Edge and to have a space to make their own work that is not involved with Double Edge, uh, but to be a, a haven and a place for space and creation. Uh, and uh, 
and realistically for that to be not a corporate exchange, uh, which is what so often happens in this kind of world that we live in. Um, and that is, that is my plan, and, and in leadership at Double Edge, that's where I focus and want to be involved more. Um, and not just for people who aren't from the area, but for uh, the First Nations community that has been invisibilized within our area that doesn't get talked to. And uh, we are lucky enough to have partners in the area who are working with us to create those spaces for people. So yeah. I think we're, yeah, we're nearing our, our time. Is there one um, more, one more question? Oh, there's three. Taiga, Taiga, what's up? Yeah, uh, that's a challenge because my parents own the land. So oh, what the was the question? The question was how were we navigating uh, and positioning space and decision around space, particularly land space, um, uh, in this sort of change? Is that would that be a good summary? Is that great? I think there's a logistical aspect to that question, which is like, do you then pay rent? To the how, how long have they been subsidizing it all out of the passion of that's their work and their company and so what happens when they still live on that space and they still own it and yet the company moves on that's a big thing to figure out logistically and um, strategically and then there is the association of, of the audience with the space as well and the association of th what is created with the space and with the community and does that move on? Does that stay local? I don't think there's any one way that that happens, and I think it's a moving, living, flexible thing. Um, I think maybe you should speak a little bit to that. Yeah, um, Double Edge, so my parents sold uh, our house where we grew up in to Double Edge. So Double Edge owns that property. Um, the stewardship of that property is a little bit combined because we have to uh, have certain agreements with the neighboring farmers in regards to keeping that farmland. Um, but the, the how do we navigate space? It's in the tenets of the theater, the bylaws of the theater, and how we operate and work with the, c the space and how we are um, involved uh, and what will happen. So the ensemble will make a decision uh, once, uh, if, once and if Stacy retires from making those decisions, um, <laughs> the, the ensemble will be deciding together how we operate and if we make changes to those spaces. And who's taking care of it? Like, the, yeah. you know, like uh, my dad will always say, like, where do you find the artistic director? Oh, he's the one, like, mucking out the toilet. You know, like the, there, there's all these things with, with having land and, and space that are maintenance and in these small organizations, right? That's just part of the keeping it mm -hmm. that you're committed to. And for us uh, at Carpet Bag, to own land where we are <coughs> is a, a literal tooth and nail fight against urban renewal. Um, so we're, we're in that base right now of trying to locate a space that we can actually have for ourselves uh, that is used for our community arts center, that is used, that is not going to give in to the pressures of uh, developers, which are coming. They've, they've made it, they've, there was even a Zillow uh, rental thing uh, that popped up. It went viral like in, in Knoxville, but it's, um, it, they literally said, get in early before gentrification so that you can get in on this property. It was something to that extent. But it, they literally named it gentrification, like they know what they're doing. So we're, that's our fight right now. We own um, two properties, an artist residency house and uh, our digital story house. Um, and then we also own a plot of land um, that's next to the Beck um, Cultural Arts Center. Uh, or uh, Beck, uh, what is it called, Joe? Beck? 
cultural exchange center, sorry. So uh, it's, but being part of that fight before it happens is really on the forefront of our minds, like to find out where we can, we put in an offer on a building. Uh, they said, some, oh, so wait, some, we put in a cash offer on a building. They said somebody was gonna buy it uh, and the building still isn't, still hasn't sold. It's still sitting in the same condition it was a year and a half ago. So we know, we, we, we are very well aware of what's going on. So that's kind of our, our goal is to find somebody who's willing to get in the fight with us and a real estate developer who's, who wants to keep um, Knoxville, East Knoxville in particular, the, the, way that it, the way that it looks now. I know that we need to wrap up here. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just really wanna say thank you for including this discussion in yes. this programming because I think that there's many of us that need to be having these discussions right now and they need to happen together. And, and I wanna say thank you to my dear friends um, for the support and for the, the dreaming together because that's, it just makes everything worth it and rich and abundant and ready. Indeed. Thank you guys also. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. We are so excited to tell you about Connector. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to uh, thank and acknowledge the incredible framing of the conversation this morning and the, the conversation that just preceded us. Um, as we talk about collaboration and co-creation, it's the, the perfect segue into what we want to share about Connector today. Uh, also, a huge thank you to ASU and their staff for hosting us here today, and hello to all of our friends joining us from uh, HowlRound. So, hello. Yeah. Woo. Woo. <laughs> Excellent. So, we'll get started. For those of you who don't know me, <laughs> uh, I'm Park Cofield. I'm the Field Resources Manager here at ne the Network of Ensemble Theaters, and I'm the, proje uh, the project manager for this new Connector uh, project. And I'd love to introduce my colleague. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Mingoba. I'm the web and data manager for NET. Uh, I've been working under the direction of Park uh, for about nine months on the back-end development. Uh, so it's been great working with the staff, the team, the community. So really excited to be here. Mark and I are both in Los Angeles, although we don't see each other much, but we, we work remotely quite a bit, like the rest of uh, the, the NET staff. So we're going to be telling you about Connector and answering this burning question, what is Connector? Then we're going to be walking you through what our co-creation process has looked like for this app and where we currently are. Then we're going to be showing you some screenshots and demo and, and telling you a little bit about what to, to, you'll expect when the app is available to you. And then we'll be talking just briefly about what's next and where we're headed. So here's the question, what is Connector? Connector is a digital platform that has been created by all of us, by the NET community. Many of the faces in the audience today have been on, in rooms with us, on phone calls, responding to beta testing. This is a, a, a program and a platform that we're building together, so thank you. It also is going to change how you interact with the network of ensemble theaters. For the first time, you'll be moving from a web-based experience to one that's in the palm of your hand. So we're moving to a more intimate, personal interaction with the NET community that will change how you interact. I still haven't answered the question, what is Connector? <laughs> so uh, I'm going to offer this video. Trent, can we have the audio, please? Mark, you may need to see if the audio connection is plugged in on the side of the computer. Yep, it looks like it is. Trent, are we good? I know. <laughs> Try pulling out the audio jack, Mark. And pause our video so we don't give away our surprises. <laughs> um, hmm. Hmm. Trent, are you in the booth or in the backstage? No? No, we got audio. Hide your eyes, hide your eyes. Okay, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna move forward. Um, I can I can audio narrate every step of the way for you. I'll do that. Hey, I hear it. Maybe that's good. Look at that. Can you do it from the mic? 
We, that's true. We can play it tonight at the mini performances. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to well. answer the, the question for us in a different way. Uh, let's go back to the slides, Mark, and we'll continue. <laughs> Co-creation. We've been talking about this a lot this week. Uh, we will continue to talk about it a lot this week. Uh, so Connector has been a process. We have started, we started with a li listening and discovery process and went through a lot of rounds of development and prototyping and iteration and change based on feedback from the net community. The listening and discovery process started uh, in 2015 with a listening tour that uh, was in 12 cities around the country. Many of you maybe were in rooms with Alicia as uh, she led these sessions, listening to the pressing needs of the net community. And one of the questions we asked was, other than money, <laughs> what are the ways that a national network can support you in creating your work, managing your organization, and finding collaborators? And we found uh, a lot, uh, we had a lot of responses to this question. But one of the things that came out of this listening tour was that the idea of creating opportunities for ourselves is really exciting. We know what we need. We have all of the resources of, uh, that, that we need to put on the road to tour to, to go to residencies. We know what we have to offer and the, our value as we're out on the road. But we just need help making the connections. The listening continued in Seattle last summer. Many of you were there as well. We uh, were in a circle led by our wonderful Lisa Mount, where we started asking this question about what does touring look like or what it could look like in the net community. Uh, we had lots of artists from lots of different disciplines, some who were touring, some who were not yet touring, some who wanted to, to, to tour in the space with us. And we looked at uh, what, what traditional presenting looked like. And so we, we understand that there, there's a power situation here where there's a presenter and an artist in a traditional presenting model. Maybe there's an agent or a manager or a tour or coordinator in between. Uh, but we left that session with another question. How do we build a system that's around non-cash-based values and resources that equalizes the playing field and remove some of the traditional privilege that exists in these touring systems that exist in the US. We had follow-up conversations after Seattle with many of you uh, that, who are here with us today. We got on the phone. Alicia met people in coffee shops in New York and, th and throughout her travels. And we asked around two different aspects, touring and presenting. And some of the things we heard about touring we're pretty surprising to us. Any time that we're not in our own space, we're touring. Yeah, maybe people agree about this. Uh, we also heard that touring is a process, not just a show. And we also heard that people are touring in lots of different ways, people comparing themselves to bands and booking gigs, and that sometimes we don't even need traditional theater spaces to do the work that we want to do. When it came to presenting, we th the word residency has a lot of different definitions depending on who you speak with. Uh, one, of them, one of the definitions was about uh, combining uh, presenting with residencies because there's a financial reality to that, that you uh, need to have a workshop attached and so maybe a residency has a workshop and a performance at the same time. We also heard that one of the reasons people are hosting and presenting is that they want new ideas and new energy injected into their their companies, and so that's a reason to bring artists to your location. And then we also heard this idea about flexibility, that ensembles, as opposed to more traditional presenters, can present with more flexibility and urgency, which we really like. So what do we do with this? We started to wonder, okay, how do we move from a mindset of scarcity into one 
of abundance. And so we started to look around the net community and figure out what do we have a lot of? What are our assets and our opportunities to solve this problem? These are the three we landed on. Shared values. There's a sense that generosity and reciprocity is at the heart of what we do as ensemble theater makers. We also learned that there's a lot of travel. You, you're on uh, planes and driving and moving around the country quite a bit, and uh, as well as for conferences, and that you're out and about. And then y'all are really smart. There's a lot of skills and expertise in the net community and a, a wide range of knowledge that exists that can be shared. So we started to put these into opportunity statements and to ask some questions. The first was, how do we use generosity and reciprocity to drive the user experience of a digital platform? And so we started looking at what does that mean? Uh, is this, it's not a one-sided matching system, it's a two-sided matching system where both parties are involved. We heard from members that there's a variety of different currency and exchange when setting up these things up. So we wanted to make a system that, was, that had opportunity for free exchanges, trades, and also cash-based exchanges. And then also this question about why do you come to an app? Are you coming because you need something? You're going to Space Finder to find the space you need in that moment? Or how do we, how do we change that experience and build an app that, that you're wanting to come to because you want to enter the space with generosity and to offer something? The next opportunity statement is how might we use geolocation to increase the kinds of connections that net members are having while traveling. So the app, we started thinking about, okay, if we have a cell phone in, in your pocket, what, do, what can we learn about geolocation and where ensembles are and how can we use that to our advantage? Uh, so we looked into how can the app use notifications uh, when you arrive in different zip codes to help you find other net members who are in the cities you're visiting or perhaps even in the city that you currently live in. We also have an idea about city guides, which I'll talk about more in a second. And our final opportunity statement is, how might we leverage the non-cash-based resources and professional skills to free up funds? How do we get the cash that we do have to the things that we need? And is there a way to maximize all of the other resources that can help uh, make that system a little bit better? So we are talking about this idea of a currency of exchange. We're also trying to help provide ways for you to think about skills and services that you offer that maybe you don't charge for, but it's something that you do. And so how do we uh, help lift up some of those unacknowledged skills that maybe you have? And there are seven different categories of offerings that we'll talk about when we walk through the app as well. So then the fun part became, we started, started to look at all of the different matching systems that exist out in the world. If we're gonna build the perfect dating app for ensemble theaters, <laughs> like how do so who's doing this best? We sort of did a, a ma sort of matrix benchmarking to see what other systems are out there, how other systems are matching people, and then we started prototyping. This is a sketch I did after the Seattle gathering, starting to think about how do we put these uh, ideas into practice and. Then we had to get uh, experts involved and other developers. And we hired Goma Games, who came to us uh, via Mark. And I'd love Mark to offer some uh, it, insight about what that relationship looks like. Sure. So uh, we did an RFP process. And I knew I couldn't do this or create the back end by myself. So we had to get experts. And uh, Goma Games uh, not just was the best in cost, but also a cultural fit. Uh, they've, we've, uh, I've worked with them before in various nonprofits. Uh, they've worked with me in uh, a couple uh, festivals, film festivals that I've done, and they've been so great. I think some of you have already worked with them uh, through the beta testing. So uh, we have John, who's our coder, uh, Kelly, uh, who's the project manager. A lot of you have interacted with her already, and T, uh, who's also one of the software developers, especially for the iOS app. So they've done a, a phenomenal job. So hi, Goma Games, if you're watching, you're here represented in the room with us. <laughs> so they took us through a period of rapid prototyping and agile design. Uh, so we slowly moved from hand-drawn schematics to slightly more uh, 
professional um, wireframes to another version that Kelly and her team, her team did that looks much better than this. And we realized this is a lot like new play development. So you start with a rough draft of something and you get audience feedback and then you continue to change and this iterative design process really matches up with ensemble theater making. That also has included a beta testing project, uh, a process. We've had about 20 members, that's a two, it looks like zero members of the net community. <laughs> Should be 20 members of the, the net community. <laughs> uh, provided feedback on features. <laughs> We have uh, several of our uh, beta testers in the room with us today. So if, if you're uh, one of our, our testers who have joined us, I'd love for you to sort of acknowledge your, yourself. I know we have Jonathan and Matt's there and Carrie and Deb Deborah is here with us. Uh, so if you have questions about what that experience was like, uh, please reach out to them. Uh, it, it's been really fun to have their uh, feedback and to see how using this app would fit into their lives and their practices with hosting and presenting and touring and residencies. Some of the things we heard from our testers was, oh, this is great, this is gonna cut down on so much of my work. I, I normally do all of this on Facebook and I have to post a message to a friend and then I have to go over here and email and check. And the revelation was, oh, well, if this is a trusted, safe community of peers who get ensemble practice and co-creation, this will streamline the work. We also heard, oh, I feel really isolated where I live and sometimes I don't feel included in the larger net conversation. This is gonna help me feel a part of something bigger. This speaks to this idea of a closed community as well. Uh, it's great that this is a closed community of like-minded artists who will understand what I'm trying to do. There's some shorthand here. If you say, oh, I need a space for this and that, or, you know, I just need a couch, or, you know, while I'm there, I need a van. There's some shorthand there that, that happens if you're working uh, with people who understand this kind of work. All right, so we're gonna take a look at some screenshots of the app and what it looks like, the moment you've all been waiting for. The connector experience begins with a login in which you will use your net member username and password, and there will be a forget password feature if you forget what you signed up with, which will probably happen. The next thing you'll encounter is a code of conduct. So, uh, please read all uh, the fine print. <laughs> There's a lot of fine print, uh, and make sure you agree to the code of conduct. Um, this is really important to keep our community safe. Um, we've worked a lot with our council and you know all the staff, of making sure we keep our community safe. These are in line with the shared values uh, for engaging in the space. Uh, we had that modeled for us in our opening session by Rebecca Moise the other night. Uh, these are our attempt at a Shared, shared values for a digital community and space, uh, including ways to uh, self-report and to moderate and keep this community safe. The next thing you'll do is you'll set up your profile, and during your profile, you'll be entering a lot of information about yourself, but a lot of it will be pre-populated from the information that you've already set up in your member profile. Uh, you'll be sharing things about your, your location, uh, the kinds of artists you work with, the communities you work with, uh, and you'll also be able to add a photo. Smile, there's Mark. <laughs> the next part of your profile and setup is using this uh, asset of travel. So we've built in an opportunity for you to be able to list the cities that you know that you're gonna be traveling to over the, the course of the next year, and you'll be adding these trips, and the, this data from your trip, trip uh, folder will help uh, customize the search results that you have in Connector and help prompt connections for you when you arrive in these cities. The city guide, I promised you we'd talk about that earlier. City guide is something that we see happen a lot in the net community where people identify themselves as uh, ambassadors or welcoming, informal welcoming parties in, in their cities. Uh, but in the connector setup, you'll be able to identify yourself and say, yes, sign me up for that. I want to make sure I know when net members are coming to my city. I'd love to be contacted when other net members are here so I can show them around. You'll be able to opt into this uh, at any point, and this is a, fe a future feature that we're working on fully implementing into the app. Then comes the offerings, this idea of generosity. What are you putting out into the net world? There are seven different categories and seven different things you can offer that include performances, 
performance venues, studio spaces, a place to stay, professional services, and equipment and uh, vehicles. You'll be able to list lots of information about each exchange or each offering, including where in the world it is uh, able to be uh, used or where you're willing to travel with it, uh, as well as uh, the things that you need from in terms of local support. Um, the is this an offering that you're putting out to the net community for free? Uh, is this something that you're willing to trade? Or is this something that you're only uh, looking for a, a fee-based service for? Um, and there are uploaders where, you'll, where you're able to upload uh, photos and videos, tech writers, videos, so people can see, see the work and engage with your, your offerings. That's the profile setup. Once you get into the app, there's lots of ways to connect and start to to explore the offerings that exist. Uh, but we've built in one sort of trick. In order to actually connect and to take advantage of an offer that's in the net system, you have to at least offer one thing yourself. So you can search, but uh, in, until you've added an offering, um, you won't be able to complete that con connection and, and make that messaging system happen. There are lots of different ways to search. You can search by offer or by people. We have lots of different filters that will help refine your searches based on location, the kinds of communities that are served, the uh, size of your venue, your space. Uh, highly customizable, but largely driven by um, the kind of offering, the kind of exchange, and the location. So you're wondering, OK, what, how do I actually connect? Well, uh, you can connect with a member through either an offering or the profile. By, and, be, and you'll be able to send a, a message to them through the app that will uh, notify you directly uh, on your phone. Try this? Yeah, let's give All it right, a go. Let's just do this. Oh, I'll probably go like this. Hey, Park. I'm looking for a couch in Los Angeles. I'm uh, staying there for a couple nights to do uh, a performance. Ding. <laughs> oh, Mark Mangoba wants to stay on my couch for a couple of nights while he comes in to Los Angeles. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> Ding. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. So the... <laughs> So the communication through the, the net platform, uh, you'll be able to customize that, how you'd like to see, receive alerts and notifications. It's designed so that you, uh, it'll push notifications to your phone, and you can customize that however you see fit that fits in with your life. Um, the, the part of the point is we, we, we're taking you to the point of connection. And beyond that, we're, we're letting you figure out the rest of the details. So feel free to take your conversations offline once you make that initial connection. Uh, whether that's to email or to a follow-up phone call. We know there are details that can't be captured in an online form and that the true exchange and connection happens over a long period of time. We've heard about how long it takes to build relationships and to establish trust. So we're taking you to the point of connection and then putting the, the um, allowing you to figure out how to, to pr proceed on that relationship. The ways that we do then still continue to support you is that we uh, we'll follow up with uh, notifications and uh, offer you um, opportunities to pro provide feedback on those resources and individuals within the net community. We also will be matching offers with resources. We don't want to just send you out into the world uh, blindly without any support. So there is a menu of resources that are attached to different kinds of offers. So uh, Deborah and I were talking about rules for homestays. These are templates and open source documents that we are collecting from the net community and some of our peer service organizations. Templates for collaboration agreements, um, tech writer models, mar uh, marketing kit options as well as links to all of the sharebacks uh, from the Net10 grant program that have come out of our uh, funding program uh, where the, uh, with knowledge sharing and resources. So all of these will be matched up to offerings, and the system will be uh, promoting these and linking these and referring the, you to use these as you go out in, into the world to set up homestays and uh, peer presenting and DIY touring models.
So what's next? So we, if we think back to the initial timeline and our snake, we are in the final testing phase of Connector. Uh, we, during this final testing phase, we're uh, working really hard on some of the uh, uh, additional features, including the resources, the city guides, some of the notifications, and we are planning for uh, a winter uh, pilot launch to the net membership in which uh, you will be able to download the Connector app, log in, and to test this in your, in your lives. Uh, it's very likely that after this event, we may include some of you in this final testing as we need a few more beta testers to, to get us to this, to this point and to test these features and to see how they work for us. Further ahead, we have big visions of what does this mean to be expansive within the, the larger ecosystem of people touring and looking at bringing in partner networks, uh, like-minded networks of artists, maybe from other disciplines, uh, who can expand our, uh, the range of where these tours and residencies and trades and exchanges can happen. And then it's about measuring impact. We've heard this uh, a little bit this morning in our, in our panel. It's important that if we want this model to work, that we prove that it works and that we quantify and look at what does a quality relationship look like that starts in a, a digital online space. So there's a lot of data that we know from the app itself, including your, uh, all of these uh, factors on the left-hand side, including race, gender, age, location, professional roles, disciplines, the kinds of communities you're working with. And then there's additional survey data that we're looking to you to help us continue to iterate on and, and change on. Uh, after a successful connection is made, you'll be encouraged to uh, provide feedback through a survey, and you'll be given an opportunity as to whether or not you want to verify a user or an offer in the system so that we can begin building a system of trust, you'll, and those verified offers will be visible with, uh, as you scroll and search the, the Connector platform. The goal is we want to paint a picture of what does ensemble touring look like in the United States. We want to hear the stories, we want to identify trends, we want to map locations and see what, is it, what does this look like in the United States geographically, and also to consider equity and how this plays a role in, in the, the development of this program. We're working with a fantastic uh, data uh, manager to help us look at this and how to quantify this, and I can't wait to share some of that data after this, the first pilot year um, to, to, to see what things look like. So uh, before I leave, I want to say a huge thank you to our lead funders for the connector and for uh, supporting this iterative design process. Uh, this is not possible without the support of the Doris Duke Foundation, Charitable Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. So a huge thank you to them. <laughs> and also a thank you to you as we continue to uh, create this together, uh, please use your connector keychains. There's a website on it. You can go and uh, s you can see the explainer video there. We'll also try to show it tonight. And you can read more and stay up, up to date with updates. So thank you. Great. Okay. Is it possible to turn up the house lights at all? No? Okay. Uh, Sabrina. Sure. So uh, the location feature in Connector has uh, nothing to do with uh, particular cities. Uh, the, you'll be able to enter wherever you're based in, in the U.S. Um, and 
you'll be able to search, the search uh, components of Connector allow you to either search uh, by particular region. So if you know you're wanting to, to tour to a particular region, you can search in that capacity, or you can drill it down um, by, by state or, or, or more specifically by city. Uh, and I think that that location data potentially could also include a, a field if you're specifically looking to work in a rural space or a, an urban environment that you could filter results in, in that way as well. Great question, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so we're planning to actually have it on desktop and mobile. So all devices, Android, Blackberry, if you really have one, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, your Apple device. So it's heterogeneous, could anywhere be accessible. One of the things we learned early in our beta testing uh, process, and Jonathan may be able to speak to this, uh, but the pr initial profile setup uh, depending on what you're offering, can be fairly intensive if there's particular text you want to offer or the photos or the videos that, that you want to attach aren't on your phone and are on your desktop. So we, we have the, the sense that people might start their connector experience through the desktop, and then as they travel and are on the go, it, it may be more mobile-based. Yeah, we actually, the whole app is API-based. So uh, when we connect to these different partners, uh, that is the way that we're going to kind of frame it. Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> API. So it's an uh, easy access point for any app to connect to another app. Uh, so with you know different security tokens and keys, if like uh, Dance USA wanted to connect with us uh, and use Connector, we could have an API that connects their data to our data. Um, of course, there's a lot more to that, but it's a simple way to connect. Oh, least, least amount. That's a good question. So. You can opt out of, of messages and notifications. So if you don't want to have connections, if you, you can do that, or you can simply not respond. Um, <laughs> California, no. Uh, you know, it, it's a good question. So in the, the profile setup, you're off also able to enter a, a brief description of yourself that, you know, I, I, it, it could be that we need to add a field or to, to look at that to visually indicate in some way what your level of comfort of engagement might, might be in the system. Um, yeah, I think that's something that we're, we'll figure out as, as we go and we have test users and people start, start uh, connecting. Yeah. yeah. Yes, behind. Yes. Yes. So uh, this is a this is a a really interesting point because a phone is a really intimate personal device, and shifting from a web-based experience with Net, where you're experience is that there's a primary contact person who's filling out the net profile and is, is the main point, communication point for your ensemble. We wanted to broaden that, and so any affiliated member or additional contact that you list within your ensemble membership profile in the net community will be given a welcome and an opportunity to set up their own username and login to function within the net community. Uh, in the connector community. Uh, and there will also be an 
organizational um, user account. So uh, Mugwumpin would have a ensemble user login to Connector, and all of your, your members and affiliate uh, contacts and anybody you identify as uh, having access will also have an individual profile in, in the space. And it's up to ensembles to decide if you want to share that organizational login, who is the person that can commit an ensemble to a particular exchange or opportunity. Um, but it, it, it's a, thank you for asking that. It's, a, it's an important distinction. Did that answer it for you? OK, great. Yes, Conrad. <laughs> yeah, start getting complaints. So, so uh, we're finishing the final beta testing, and so between now and the end of the year, we'll be enrolling a couple of additional members to help us test the system, and then we're aiming for the pilot launch in winter, and what that will mean is there will also uh, be a system put in place where we capture glitches and complaints, if you'd like to lab label them that way, um, and issues. So we're, crowd we're, we're continuing this idea of crowdsourcing the the, the problems that arise so that our development team can, and Mark and Kelly and Goma Games can continue to iterate and design through that pilot uh, launch, which will be about a year. So to answer your question, er, you know, early, early winter is what we're aiming for, and then the pilot launch will e extend for a year in which we're testing this, continuing to make small changes, and measuring what this first year looks like. Uh, currently, it is U.S.-based. We've made a distinction to focus on U.S.-based touring at the moment. Um, we some some of that is uh, constrained by uh, legal ramifications of of phone and app devices. Uh, some of that is intentional in terms of focusing around the work that's happening in the U.S. Yeah, Mark, do you want to add anything about the, the international work? In yeah. So then other. Uh, obviously, in other countries, there's like GDPR and different, you know, rules that we have to follow. So, maybe someday, but we'll, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. Ah, such a good question. So, I I believe that everybody has something to offer. Uh, we we've the list of professional services. I, I'd love to, to show, and, and uh, I wish I could do that, but the, the list of professional services is, is pretty extensive and continues to grow. So I wanted, I wanted to share one example of what a, uh, an iteration, a very recent iteration looked like. So I was on the phone with an ensemble-based artist who mentioned that they were uh, traveling and touring, and one of the biggest sort of pain points was finding equipment for an infant while they were on the road traveling and touring. And I said, oh. Well, we can add that into Connector as a, a piece of, of, of a professional service. So childcare got added to the list within 24 hours. And equipment got added in terms of, uh, you know, cribs and infant supplies and materials that could be sourced locally when you arrive at, at a, a destination for, for a tour. So uh, the, the professional services and the equipment list is, is pretty extensive and we're in encouraging people to think about those untapped skills that they have, whether that's pet sitting, house sitting, offering graphic design, helping set up a 501c3, or particular knowledge or skills that's particular to the kind of work you do. And uh, I imagine that as we move forward, the ways in which NET sort of helps prompt and provoke those, uh, oh yeah, I, I do know how to do that, will become more apparent. Thanks for asking. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. And thank you to all of you, I'm so excited. Uh, to be modeling ensemble practice in a digital space, I think it's pretty cool for the field and excited to have been able to talk with so many of you and grateful. I know Mark and Kelly and her team have been really excited uh, about, oh yeah, wow, you guys, are, you guys are great testers and are giving us really good things to think about. So thank you all. <laughs>